the greatest storyteller ever. It's God, and you know what's amazing? He is writing our story, your story, Tom and our story, and we are so excited because today we have a part two where we're diving into an incredible family story. So Tom, tell us a little bit about who's coming up today. Yeah, yesterday we had uh, Tracy Scott and Alicia McConnell, Monday's program, and uh, Tracy told her story about how God set her free and healed her son. And today, it was, it was powerful, by the way. It was, if you haven't seen it, watch this program, then go back to YouTube and look for Monday's program, and you will be blessed to hear that program as well. But today, we'll be talking more about Alicia's uh, story. And Sydney, the, uh, she has a powerful story, too, of God's uh, working in her life, working yeah. through her life. Yeah, like working through her life when it comes to transplants. So you definitely want to stay tuned for how God orchestrated and all it all. So, you know, one thing I just love about when we hear people's stories and their testimony, it's amazing that God uses every little piece, every little fragment, and he puts it back together again. He infuses it. And, you know, one thing I love that, you know, we know that our God is good. Yeah. And I recently heard that, uh, like I was studying in the Hebrew word with good, it says word tov. And tov means to be in harmony. It means to be in tune. And so one thing I think about when it comes to our lives, it comes to the situations and the circumstance we're walking in. Are you in harmony? Are you in tune with the spirit? Because through the Holy Spirit, that's how he weaves his thread into every part of our being. And I think we should, I think especially today, expect God to do something amazing. God's an amazing God. Expect him to do something consistent with his amazing, incredible character, miracle working character. Expect that God is going to do something. Today could be a day of freedom for you. Well, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with Tracy and Alicia. Cornerstone Television exists to spread the good news through Bible-based programs and a fully staffed prayer line. Through CTVN, lives are saved, hearts, minds, and bodies are healed, and Jesus is lifted high. We can't do this work without you. Would you consider sending a gift this month to keep the gospel moving forward with power? When you give, we'll send you Listen, Love, Repeat, which presents scriptural examples of those who lived alert, including Jesus, who noticed those who least expected to be seen, gives creative ideas for showing love to friends and family, suggests practical ways to reach out to the lonely, marginalized outcast, helps you comfort the grieving, and so much more. Ask for your copy of Listen, Love, Repeat when you give today. Call 888-665-4483 or go to ctvn.org slash donate. Thank you for your generosity. Hope happens here. On Monday's program, we set out to remind you that God is still the God of miracles. We heard from Tracy Scott and how God performed incredible miracles in her, in her life. And today we're going to hear from her daughter, Alicia, and how God has done some unbelievable things in her life too. Tracy and Alicia, welcome back to Hope Today. Thank you again for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, yesterday, Tracy, we heard your story. Um, there's a lot more to it, but you were in the middle of a story about how God called you to Florida to pray for a man. Could you yes. f just finish that up yes, for I us? Can. So um, again, um, God had put on my heart to go to Florida to pray for this gentleman who was um, diagnosed with um, the last stages of cancer. He was in his 50s. Um, I love praying for people. I love seeing God work miraculously. I don't like to travel. So <laughs> I kept thinking, Lord, is there no Christians in Florida? Like, why me? I live in Pennsylvania. I will probably never return because I get lost really easy. He wouldn't let it go. And so being the obedient person I am, I said, well, okay, Lord, you, if my husband's okay with this, I'll go. Uh, my husband never tells me no, but he's protective. So I'm like, oh, he's gonna be like, you can't do this. So I went down to the garage where he was working. I said, hey, um, Friday after work, I'm gonna drive to Florida. I'll be home Sunday morning. Um, I need to pray for someone. He's like, oh, okay. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> really, the first time you don't have... So um, long story short, um, Alicia said, oh, I'll go with you too which wasn't really a lot of comfort because she gets lost. She's really helping my brother would go. He's much better at navigating. He's probably the wingman you want. So um, we left after work. It was about six o'clock Friday evening. It was a 16 hour drive. And I have to be honest, we had about $400 in our bank account. So I'm like, Lord, you got to do the miraculous here. So we just started driving, drove 16 straight hours. Um, we were on a spiritual high, just really praising God, listening to teaching tapes. Just, it was a really good trip. Um, but about a half hour before we got there, 
between being in the car so long together and realizing like, what are we doing? I, I started to get a little nervous. <laughs> and I said, oh, Alicia, you, you think this is the right thing to do? And she was like, oh Lord. <laughs> She's like, we just drove 16 hours. So we got to the people's house and I said, they're gonna think we're like a cult Let's be or honest, something. She wouldn't get out of the car. We drove all of that way. <laughs> we're on each other's last nerves because I had not got to use the restroom or eat. And she was like, I can't go in. So I did what any good daughter would do, and I threatened to mess up that perfect hair. I was like, you will get out of the car on your own, or I will get you out of this car. And she goes, they'll think we're with a cult. She goes, you have to knock on the door first. So, you know, she sent me, and I knocked on the door, and they thought we were from a cult. Well, that was the first thing the lady said. She goes, are, are you a Jehovah's Witness? And I said, no. <laughs> I said, um, I just, I, I'm from Pennsylvania where some of your family lives. I said, I just really felt led to come down and pray with your husband. So he came out and you could tell he was in the last stages of cancer. And um, the only thing the Holy Spirit let me say was, I just drove 16 and a half hours um, to tell you that God loves you. And I couldn't say anything else. <laughs> And she's giving me the evil eye, like, we did not just drive 17 hours to tell this man that God loves him. Everybody knows God loves them. But I couldn't say anything else. We just stood there, they stood there, and he starts crying after a few moments. And then the wife starts crying, and I, I was like, Lord, you gotta work here. I don't know what's going on. And all of a sudden he said, I just told the Lord yesterday that if he didn't prove to me he still loved me, I was ending my life on Sunday, which was the next day. And I just started crying. <laughs> and and the Lord showed me, because then I realized why he had to send someone from Pennsylvania. It would have been a really big act for a neighbor to walk across, you know, and say, hey, I want you to know God loves you. God will do anything for the one. Every person Absolutely. is so important to him. And it taught, taught us such an incredible lesson that, um, yes, it's nice to preach to crowds. Yes, it's nice to, to, to pray with the masses but God will do anything for just the one. And it was such an incredible time. We ended up praying with a man for about an hour and went back in our car and drove home. <laughs> but it changed his life and he got into the ministry and was able to go to high schools. But God taught us the one is that important to him. He would leave the 99 to find that one. <laughs> and I think he just put a burden on our heart that that one is so important and precious in his eyes. So, uh, I mean, what an incredible story. I mean, that's a mission trip right there. Uh, you know, one hour of ministry for uh, like about 36 hours of driving. Um, but tell me, uh, Alicia, t tell us what, where has God worked in your life? Because we know there's some amazing things he's done as well. You certainly grew up in, a, in an area where there was a lot of faith and a lot of trust in God for miracles. What has God done through you and in your life? I was really fortunate. I kind of had a heritage of faith. My grandparents were saved. My parents were, I grew up seeing miracles. So children, they're like sponges. They take all of that in. So I never... I never doubted. I remember I got saved in a church preschool after hearing about Jonah and it just, God was always a huge part of our foundation. Um, but I think the rubber meets the road once you're an adult, once you leave that household, <laughs> once you're not necessarily under your parents covering anymore. They're always there believing for you. Um, but my husband and I got married when I was 20. We had dated for about six months before our wedding day, and we're celebrating 10 years married. So we were just crazy enough, uh, and we knew we wanted to have a big family. He was also from a big family himself. He grew up um, in a Christian household, and we didn't see any reason to wait. So a few months into our marriage, we found out we were pregnant, and we were ecstatic, to say the least. Um, and within a few weeks, I had my first miscarriage. And while we were devastated, we knew that God had plans for us to be a family. Um, ever since I was three or four years old, I always had a doll in my hand. I always pretended to be a mom. I knew in life that was my calling. My first calling was to be a wife and mother. So um, we didn't wait a whole lot longer and we were trying again and we got pregnant for a second time and we're very excited. And um, that also ended in a miscarriage. And I think that is when I just, I felt so broken. I remember I had three surgeries um, that fall and I remember New Year's Eve literally just laying on my couch and feeling like, Lord, hope is just so dangerous and crushing me. And I really felt like God spoke to me for one of the first times as an individual and was like, I never left your side. I was there each time you were in the hospital. I just felt like he was there with me each time going into surgery and that he had not forgotten me 
or the dreams that he had spoken into my heart. So I remember um, just really pouring my heart out to God and saying, you know, if, if I hope one more time, if I'm willing to use this as my weapon, like I will hold my child. And my mother had bought me um, a little pair of cheetah print gladiator sandals from Cracker Barrel that I had in a box because I, each time I found out I was pregnant, I would pull them out and I would pray over them and then I would tuck them away. And I'd pull them out and pray over them and I'd tuck them away. And I was just declaring, my daughter will wear those shoes. And so I kind of coined a phrase. I said, it takes faith the size of baby shoes to move the heart of God. And my husband and I found out we were pregnant that February. So I just kind of poured my heart and soul out to the Lord on New Year's Eve and found out in February we were expecting again. And my little Mia is six years old now. I had, I had to do battle. I said, you know, I declared a thing. I will hold my daughter. I will see my daughter wear these shoes. And um, God was so faithful to meet us. And so it just restored my hope. You know, hope anchors the soul. And I knew that God had not forgotten about those dreams that he had put into my heart as a child. Um, so shortly after Mia was born, we knew we wanted to have more children. So... When you're in love, it's not too hard trying to have children and bring more uh, little lives into the family. And we found out we were pregnant um, a little bit after Mia's first birthday. And we were so excited. My mom sent me flowers. And um, the one time a year my mom and I go to the gym, uh, I was telling her, you know, just about my plans to decorate the nursery, what we were going to do this time around. And she mentioned a friend of the family um, needed prayer. She said, Bruce needs a kidney. And um, we're just praying and believing that God's going to do a miracle in his life. And I, um, I always heard my mom say, I love so-and-so so much, I'd give them a kidney if they needed it. So I remember telling her, I said, well, after I have this baby, if Bruce needs a kidney, I'll donate a kidney to him. And I think I stayed quiet slightly because I didn't want to cancel that miracle. But I thought God has to be in this because no normal person wants to give a kidney. Yeah. So I thought God must have put this on her so heart. That was like a saying. You say, I love them I so much, I give them a kidney. I love them it's so just... much, I give them a kidney. I don't know why I did that for decades. <laughs> but it goes to show the importance of planting that seed. And I think, I think God had her saying that all of those years because nice he was doing a work in my life. So your baby was born? So my little girl um, was a little over a year and we knew that we were expecting and we knew that Bruce needed a kidney. So we were praying for him and I... I happened to see him at my parents' house. And I told him, I said, well, when I have my child in November, if you still need a kidney, I would like to have the information to your transplant team. I would donate a kidney to you. And Bruce said, well, God's doing a miracle. I'm not waiting that long. I said, well, I'm glad. Like, I'll believe with you. God's doing a miracle. You're not going to have to wait till after November. Um, and we kind of parted ways. Mm -hmm. And a few weeks later, um, I had my third miscarriage. Wow. And I was, I was crushed, to say the least. Um, it was right around Mother's Day, and I just, I think sometimes it's so important to just be vulnerable with God. I think sometimes as a Christian, we feel like we have to have it all together, and God doesn't want to see that mess. God knows that mess. God loves you in that mess. And it was one of those days when my husband was at work, and I was just at the kitchen table, and I just felt so safe and vulnerable just to be like, Lord, I don't understand. You know, I'd had several surgeries. I'd carried life with me, and I'd lost it. And I just remember telling the Lord, you know, these doctors told me that I can't carry life. You know, they gave me all these reasons why. I'm like, I'm not satisfied. Like you created me to carry and bring forth life. Like Lord, to heal my broken heart. Like I know that I'm going to see my children in heaven. I know they're not lost. But to heal my heart, I need to know that you're going to use me to bring forth life. And at that moment, I didn't know what that looked like. Um, and I remember, uh, so that was in May. In June, I saw Bruce's daughter at a park when I was taking my, my own daughter to the park. And I asked, how's your dad? And she said, well, we're believing for a miracle. And I give her credit because she didn't speak anything negative. I said, well, I'd love to be a part of that miracle. I'm like, I need his number. I need to reach out and get the information to contact the transplant team. So um, in June, I contacted his transplant team and started the process to become a donor. And we were a match. So I think God was working even in those details. And so I went through five months of testing. I mean, they, they know you inside and out. There's no secrets with your transplant team. But we were a go. And um, patience has not always been my strong suit. So I was nicely calling them and thanking them like every week, like, hey, thank you so much for everything you're doing for me. Do you have an update? When can I come in for this next testing? You know, because typically it would take a few weeks or a month in between each process. I'm like, can we get in next week? Do you have anything available? And, 
you know, God had his hand in the timing, but I ended up donating my kidney to Bruce the same week that I was due to have my son, which was born into heaven. And I think even in that, God just showed me that he works all of those details out for the good. So each year, um, that week before Thanksgiving in November, I donate on November 16th, we celebrate that Bruce is still living and we um, have like lit the little paper lanterns and celebrated Jacob's life because I feel like with each of my pregnancies, there was a love that was created and that love was meant to change the world. That love may have taken its first breath into heaven and not into my arms, but I was given a gift of a love that was called to change the world. And so with that, with Jacob's life, uh, you know, I'm now able to talk about Bruce is alive and well today. And God's hand was all over every piece, every messy, ugly, broken, bitter piece. But through it all, there was hope. There was hope that anchored our soul. And so donating my kidney to Bruce, um, it, healed, it healed my heart. And I laughed because my mother watched my child and I sent her flowers that day and I thanked her for giving me the faith to believe that when we love someone, we would share a kidney. And I said to her, I said, God loves to do the miraculous. I said, I'm gonna pray that God restores that kidney and you're gonna have two healthy kidneys. And she's like, wonderful, because I can donate again. And I said, I'll be the first person <laughs> living to donate two kidneys. I said, well, God, maybe not. <laughs> you do your will, God, whatever you, you did. did donate again. I did. Tell me about that. So, I think to be honest, maybe the transplant team in my family thought the painkillers were kicking in because I remember just a few days after donating my kidney, I read this story about a Jewish rabbi who had donated his kidney and went on to donate a portion of his liver. And while I was kind of crocheting and reading that, I was like, I'm gonna donate my liver. And my mom and husband were like, let's get you, you know, to your six week <laughs> appointment and see how you're feeling. And so I remember when I went in for my follow-up, I, I asked my transplant team, I said, so tell me, like, how can I go about donating a portion of my liver. And they looked at me for a moment and said, we don't even do liver transplants at this hospital. And that didn't stop me. I said, okay, well, I'll see you in six months. We'll talk about it again. And so at six months and at my year, and um, I laughed because my, my nurse transplant, uh, my coordinating nurse of the transplant team, she messaged me after my first uh, year appointment and she told me, she was like, I want you to realize how miraculous it is your kidney is functioning at 99.7% of what your kidney function was with two kidneys. Wow. So when I went in to donate, you know, they, they tell you all of the risks and benefits. And to be honest, there's not a whole lot of benefits. The benefits is like, you may save someone and the risks are pages. And so she, she told me, she said, you know, when you donate, essentially they take half. So you're left with essentially half. I mean that you're young and you're healthy, um, your one remaining kidney will become more efficient and compensate for some of that loss. So we expect to see you between 70, maybe 80% kidney function after two full years. And so after one year, I was at 99.7% kidney function. And there was only one kidney in there at that point in time. But God just did the miraculous. I mean, even the transplant nurse was like, I need to, to let you know how big of a, a miracle this is. This doesn't typically happen. I said, well, God's just preparing me because typically they don't like you to donate your liver after a kidney. They'd prefer you to donate your liver first because your liver regenerates. And then with your kidney, typically they don't see any type of regeneration. So I was like, God's working this all out. That one kidney is functioning like two. It's keeping myself alive and healthy and Bruce is alive and healthy. Um, and so the transplant team was extremely gracious with me, but they said, we don't do liver transplants. So I didn't take that as a no. I said, okay, well, I just contacted the other hospital in Pittsburgh and failed out to become, um, they call it an all-transic donor. I didn't have somebody that I knew as a recipient. Um, so I started the process with them right before my two-year uh, anniversary of donating my kidney. And um, at one point, I, so, you know, a couple of people through Facebook had sent me a link to somebody who needed a liver. And so I tried to, to donate to her and it didn't work out with the transplant team. You have to be very sick but you have to be healthy enough to make it through a major surgery. Um, so the transplant list kind of ebbs and flows, but I think God was working a miracle there too. So I started the process. I met with the team in October and I was approved as a donor in February. And being that I didn't have an intended recipient, they said, you know, within about six months, I would assume you'll get a call, um, but it takes some time to match you. So that was in February and I got a call in March 
and they said, can you donate next week? Like we have somebody who had um, been scheduled and their donor backed out. Can you be here in one week? And so I had to laugh. I sat on my steps and I just, I was so overwhelmed with the love of God and with his joy. I remember just getting like a little teary and calling my mom to make sure that my daughter would be taken care of and calling my husband and it was a go. So we embarked on round two. I think that's, if I can interrupt, I think that's an important point is you weren't just doing this uh, just on a humanistic level. You were doing this as, a, as something you felt God's pleasure and purpose in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was people that said, like, how does she have so much joy in this? Because those surgeries were very intense and painful. <laughs> and I said, I think God gave us a small glimmer of what, when Jesus says, for the joy set before him. He saw the future, not that moment. And I believe that's what was happening with her. She saw the outcome instead of that moment of pain. And I like to think the joy of the Lord is our strength. Because I'm going to be completely transparent with you. On my own strength, I would not <laughs> want to donate <laughs> an organ. I mean, it, it is a big surgery. There's a lot of recovery time, a lot of downtime. God calls you to that. So I was just crazy enough to believe that God called me to it. He's prepared a way and I'm going to walk in it. Um, and there is, there is such a joy in just feeling like I'm, I get to be a part of somebody's miracle. And that was the cry of my heart several years ago at my little dining room table. I told the Lord, to heal my heart, I need to feel like I can bring forth life like you created me to. And isn't it funny? Like what we ask God for, he'll give us. If you don't dig up out of doubt the seeds you plant in faith, I believe despite the doctors telling me my body won't bring forth life, I believe God created me to bring forth life. God's creative. He didn't necessarily need me to have children, more children on the side of earth to bring life into the world. I have two gentlemen out there with the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus running through an organ that was once in my, you know, my, my body. So um, it was just, it was tremendous to see God's hand in transplant. And Alicia, what would you say, like, I know there's a lot of people that have gone through transplants and need that. What would you say the person that may be on the fence right now, just after hearing your story of, I want to donate, I want to give, but they don't, they're in this like in between place. What would you say to that person right now? I'd be completely transparent with you. I'd say, make sure that God has called you to that. But if that's on your heart, that's probably not, the enemy is not going to say, you should give life to somebody else so they can find Jesus. Um, you know, God is a loving, gracious father and he'll meet you where you're at. But I've also learned if you want to kill a big dream, tell it to small minded people. Um, through my process, I had, I had people tell me I was a selfish mother I had people tell me that God told them I would die if I, if I did this. People <laughs> oh through the goodness. church, um, a pastor's wife. But I had this little precious seed of faith that God had deposited in my heart. And I was willing to hold on to that. So if God has called you to it, you're going to know because it's not a natural thing to want to give in that way. That's a, it's a mark of the Father. Our Father gives good gifts. Our Father is a generous, loving Father. So the enemy is not going to confuse you with giving an act of love like that. And we do, we've always said that uh, God's a healer. He loves to heal, it's, it's who he is. Um, but he uses many different ways we've learned. Absolutely. You know, I, I love the supernatural healing. I mean, it's the most wonderful. <laughs> but sometimes he sees the whole picture when we don't. And I think sometimes even the recipients need to know that they're so dearly loved that someone would do this for them. And I think God's doing a whole work in them when this happens. So I think it's, it's fair. I mean, I'd be like, get your hands off my liver. I'm not, I'm not giving anybody my liver. liver. Yeah, I mean, I already gave my kidney. I'm not, you know. Right, right. But uh, it's, it's amazing to see that. Would you pray for somebody out there, uh, Alicia? Would you just uh, pray for, especially for someone too that has gone through that heartache of miscarriage and that heartache of, of losing a child and they're still standing or they've lost hope or they don't know what to do. Maybe you could just bring them to before the Lord. Heavenly Father, I just thank you. I thank you for your precious children. Lord, I just, I feel your love so strong for the brokenhearted. Lord, you've called us, Lord, your child, and we don't grieve like those with no hope. Hope can be a weapon. It can anchor our soul. And Lord, I would just pray for the brokenhearted out there, for the mother who's grieving the loss of a precious child. 
Lord, just restore her hope. Give her a vision of that child in heaven. You know, I know that my children are awaiting me one day, that my treasures are stored in heaven, Lord, that they are loved by you, that they've only known your perfect love. Lord, I just pray that you would impart that to any mother right now that's grieving a loss of a child. And Lord, just for anyone that's on the transplant list or a loved one is on the transplant list, I would just pray that you would restore their hope. Hope is our weapon, Lord. We anchor our hope in you. Lord, that you are a God of the miraculous, that you heal and you restore and you give good gifts. So thank you for that strength in you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, just as you were like sharing your story, Alicia, the one thing I just kept hearing God was saying is like someone is in need of a heart transplant. And it's a spiritual heart transplant. And I love what the word says that he turns our heart of stone into a heart of flesh. And so maybe today that there's something deep in your heart that is aching, that it's bitter, but God right now wants to do the greatest exchange and that's what he does. He's in the business of giving us new hearts, restoring those places. Maybe there has been a deep, bitter root of pain, of loss, of rejection, and you can totally agree and say like, I've been in that place where there's no hope because hope deferred makes the heart sick. But today God wants to say, I want to take the sickness in your heart I want to redeem it, I want to change it, and I did it through my son, Jesus. So today, just stretch out your hand and receive the love that God wants to give. And did you know that in the Hebrew word, I love it, ahava actually means to give. That's why God gave his only begotten son, Jesus. That's what God is in the business of doing. He loves to give, to show his love. And so we want you to know the love of Jesus that he's with you in the midst of it all. And today you can give us a call on our prayer line at 888-665-4483 because we know that God is doing a miraculous thing in your heart today. Thank you both so much for just sharing your stories and your testimony, being so transparent and open with us today. Thank you for having us. Oh, yeah. well, it, was, it was our joy. And we've heard today, we've heard about healings, we've heard about love. And those are the two things. God's a God of miracles. He's a God that wants to do a miracle in your life. The greatest miracle, of course, is to know him. So first, be sure that you know him, that you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. But he wants to do miracles in other areas of your life. But I'm impressed so much more that God is a God of love and relationship. That you can hear the voice of God. Just seek him and he'll speak to you and he'll show you his love.